Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Tisch Library. My name is Laura Wood. I'm the director of Tisch Library. And on behalf of the Friends of Tufts Libraries, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the ninth John Holmes Memorial Poetry Reading featuring Rosanna Warren, award-winning professor and poet. Our poetry reading is named in honor of the first Tufts poet, John Holmes, who was a professor at Tufts from 1934 to 1962. He taught his students the craft of writing poetry, inspired them by being an active poet himself, and often invited poets to come to campus to read their work. By establishing the John's, John Holmes Memorial Poetry Reading eight, uh, nine years ago, Tufts continues the tradition that John Holmes started, and we're delighted to continue it today. Uh, after the introduction and the poetry reading, we will have a question and answer period. Um, as the event is being recorded, we do ask if you would wait for a microphone before asking your question, uh, and that will make it possible for everyone to hear you as well. I also want to invite you to stay with us for refreshments afterwards. There will also be a book signing, and so the author will be at the back of the room um, if you would like to um, uh, join us for that. And I'd like to thank the Tufts Bookstore for sign uh, sponsoring the book signing. I would also like to welcome Rebecca Kaiser Gibson, and she will provide the introduction for our poet. Rebecca is a lecturer in creative writing at Tufts, teaching poetry and writing in the English department. She has her MA in creative writing from Boston University, as well as an MAT in directing theater from Columbia Teachers College, and an MA in directing from the University of Pittsburgh. A former Fulbright Scholar and recipient of the Fellowship in Poetry from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, she's been teaching at Tufts since 1995. I'm very grateful to the English Department and Rebecca for partnering with us on today's event. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca Kaiser Gibson for our introduction today. Thank you. Hi. Rosanna Warren has been honored quietly and persistently by the most noted arbiters of poetry in America. Among her multiple awards are the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award of Merit in Poetry, the Witter Brinner Poetry Prize, the Sarah Teasdale Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Lamont Prize, and many, many distinguished others. She served as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets for six years. Recently, she's become professor of, in the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, which is very prestigious. She has always worn her many heavy laurels lightly. Rosanna attended high school in Switzerland, graduated from Yale with a degree in painting, then earned an MA from the writing seminar at Johns Hopkins. Her work is evidence that being erudite in academics can enhance one's passionate attention to the substance and evanescence of substance of life. I will focus for a minute on her precise attention simultaneously to the stuff of life and to the transmutation of it into spirit that characterizes, at many levels, her latest astonishing book, Ghost in a Red Hat. Ghosts, not only the almost literal appearance and vanishing form of a long-deceased mother who opens the book, and the memory of the poet's own spectral, semi-starved adolescent self in the poem that closes it, haunt the book. Not just ghosts, per se, but shadows, clouds, floatings, passings, half-heard murmurings, waves, flashes of light, darkenings. These are not a clever unifying device, but an unflinching testament to the paradox of presence and absence that informs all of her work. Rosanna's perspective is devoid of sentimentality or easy reassurances. The opening poem, Cassandra, of her previous book, Departure, tellingly begins, don't say that word, comfort and goes on to describe instead being in the vault, murmuring, embracing urns that have yet to be filled with a story that has yet to spark or char the mind. What is, what was, what will be, the shadows cast, the lives lived, the deaths died, corpses and clouds, devastations, personal and political, are equally and precisely witnessed. Rosanna does not turn away 
but steadily with a saturated passion of stained glass, pieces together, fragments, impressions, notations, evidences, beings who have been and remain to be reckoned with. Rebecca, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm very moved and grateful. And I'm moved uh, to be invited here to celebrate uh, the memory of John Holmes. Um, and I, I have a particular attachment to his, his, his figure because his widow, Mrs. Holmes, taught me English, uh, not in Switzerland, but at Milton Academy a long time ago. And... Uh, read Chaucer with her and other illuminating souls. And so I had a sense of John Holmes through her and read his poems. And I will start now by reading one of his poems. And I'm just looking at my watch so I don't overtax anybody's attention. All right. Um, this is by John Holmes. Stars. A dark night and half in shade of somber cedar trees, an old man stood and gazed at heaven and its twinkling stars. And long he looked and all his thoughts went back and back, retracing life from early youth up to the present where he stood, gazing at blackness. And he said, Time was when in the sky more shining stars were set and twinkling, as well as in my own sky as that above, but now they glimmer not so bright, or some are gone, and utter darkness seems to come, and life is nearly done. There was a time when more stars shone than now. So, thank you, John Holmes. I'll read some poems from Ghost in a Red Hat and then some newer, perhaps rawer poems. And I'll, I'll start with the poem that um, Rebecca mentioned, the poem that evokes my mother as a kind of ghost. Mediterranean. When she disappeared on the path ahead of me, I leaned against a twisted oak all I saw was evening light where she had been, gold dust light where a moment before and 38 years before that, my substantial mother strode before me in straw hat, bathing suit and loose flapping shirt. Every summer afternoon, her knapsack light across her back, her step in sandals firm on the stony path, as we returned from the beach, and I mulled small rebellions and observed the dwarfish cork trees with their pocky bark, the wind wrestled oaks with arms akimbo, while shafts of sea light stabbed down between the trunks. There was something I wanted to say at the age of 12, some question she hadn't answered. And yesterday, so clearly seeing her pace before me, it rose again to the tip of my tongue. And the mystery was not that she walked there ten years after her death, but that she vanished and let twilight take her place. Um, another of the... the presences and absences in this book is my friend, the writer, Deborah Tall. There are six poems here remembering her. Um, she died of breast cancer a few years ago. So I'll read one for her. And there's a, I was so moved. There, there's a photograph of Deborah out in the glass case, uh, out in the lobby there. Um, she's a wonderful writer, poet and nonfiction writer. There's an epigraph from one of her poems here. Aftermath, dawn, the moment it was, it was over. Deborah Tall. It was that last euphoric summer between one chemo and another when you looked out your kitchen window 
and saw the doe standing at the edge of your lawn where the thicket gathers autumn olive, buckthorn, forsythia, dogwood. And when you stepped outside, the doe stayed still and looked in your eyes, you thought, with a companionable, complicit question and didn't run. You were light-headed. The doe lowered her nose to shove at the small bundle at her feet, folded up like an awkward deck chair, till then invisible in its hollow of grass. She had just given birth. The fawn couldn't stand, but raised its too large head to gaze at you. You were, as you said, already more or less posthumous. You took each other in, one of you before, the other beyond fear. Two creatures, side effects on one another, headed in opposite directions. Um, there's a, there's a, a great deal of tonal variety in, in this book. I, I was about to say, hope it doesn't upset you, but then I also thought, I hope it does upset you. <laughs> so here's a very different tone. Fear. And I'll just say that if this poem doesn't make sense to you, that's probably as it should be, because it's about someone with paranoid schizophrenia. It doesn't make sense if you're outside of it. Fear. I follow, trying to pick up scraps of the poem as you drop them, you hide them, but they rustle. I pry them out from under cushions, under the bed. I pluck them like beaded curtain strings from the whoosh of water in the shower where you pretend to bathe when you are no one. No one is afraid of water. No one carves the soap so it won't touch his skin. It's the throb and splatter of water that drums the color out of each day. Good day, hello, hollow spider fingers, sunken eyes, anti-soap for anti-matter. You look out from a burned out star, light years away, still emitting Photons with that appealing, deep, affectionate dog's look of frightful understanding, a magic cloak of smell no one will touch. No one is safe. No one plays golf with interstellar swings so the ball never lands. TV keeps reciting the right spell day and night. The door is sealed shut with masking tape Daylight strips human skin like acid. As long as the danger lived outside me, I couldn't write. It wants to crawl through the keyhole, slide over the windowsill. It breathes in the shirts hanging in the closet. It rots the cheese. It lives in my breath. It hides in the pages of the palms of Paul Verlaine like a smear of shit. It has signed a contract in ink squeezed from stars. You are the gentlest prayer. You see where the shadow falls across each eye. Of course, of curse, song of all our days. You were empty, so I drew a shrine, and it stayed empty. And in another tonal shift, the, as Rebecca suggested, some of these poems have to do with uh, more outside life. I think of you know, public and political life, which is hard to separate from the personal. This poem is called Porta Portese, which is the name of the big flea market in Rome. And I tell my Italian friends they shouldn't be offended because it's really about Wall Street. And I'm proud that I wrote this poem 
in the summer of 2008, before things quite exploded. Porta Portese. If it once gleamed, if it tipped, if it buzzed, if it oiled eternal youth, if it whispered on an old tape with the sexual lure of infinite cash, if it said, I am your private castle and you are a queen, if it lit a thousand bulbs, if it shaved a thousand hairs, if it declared, God loves you, if it promised to cure hair lips, eczema, scabies, rage, if it clipped hangnails, if it delivered proverbs, if it hugged the ass, it's laid out on a collapsible table or a mat on asphalt. Money will change hands. Money will change us all. Change gypsies, professors, Nigerian whores, limping children, drugged Babies, iPodded teens, Somali refugees, artists in drag, illegal Albanians, cruising poles. We said, one world. We said, isn't my money good enough for you? Switch blades, switch banks. The cloaca maxima accepts all currencies. The Tiber leaks yellow between its legs. Venereal, venerable, duty-free, luxurious, silken, rippling, classical waves sold and soldered, solved, reflected here. Um, I read this poem in the fall of 2008 at some New York occasion and a banker afterwards came up to me and said, you don't understand money. <laughs> and I said, I think I do. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, and somewhat in that vein, um, this is a poem called Fire, and the street mentioned here, Mutanabi Street, is the street in Baghdad famous for its booksellers, bookshops. Fire. It would take a voodoo skull, one eye darkened, one candle lit, to see into these pictures. Who set that fire? Who piled that cliff of smoke? The newsprint is jaundiced, ripped at the edge. I set that fire. I piled that bombastic mountaining smoke. I mound it up every night, and I don't haul anyone out. The bodies are stiff, like little T-squares. It's not clear what geometry problem they solve. The ditch is a rampart. The live ones, turbaned, stand on the upper rim. Bombed trucks burn rectangularly. The books on Mutanabi Street make a chunky oatmeal mush. This world, the same for all, was shaped by no god or man, but always was and will be an everlasting fire, said Heraclitus, and the child in the charred room reaches out to touch the wall. The furniture's burned, his father's shot, the mirror reflects only the camera flash. We found fire in our souls before we stole it from heaven. Now we are the lords of light. And the dark room is ours. Let's see. Well, in another kind of state of mind, here's a little New England scene. Man in stream. You stand in the brook, mud smearing your forearms a bloodied mosquito on your brow, your yellow t-shirt dampened to your chest as the current flees between your legs, amber, verdigris, unraveling today's story 
last night's travail. You stare at the father beaver eye to eye, but he outstares you, you who trespass in his world, who have, however unwilling, yanked out his fort, stick by tooth gnarled, mud clabbered stick, though you whistle vespers to the wood thrush and trace flame flicker in the grain of yellow birch. Death outpaces us. Upended roots of fallen trees still cling to moss furred granite. Lichen smolders on wood rot. Fungus trails in wisps. I wanted a day with cracks to let the god light in. The forest is always a nocturne, but it gleams. The birch tree tosses its change from palm to palm. And we who unmake are ourselves unmade, if we know, if only we know, how to give ourselves in this untendered light. Am, am I audible back there? Is it, yes? Thank you. I'm just putting this up. It's a slight there. That's a better angle. I was hunching over it in a kind of uncomfortable way. <laughs> Let's see. How are we doing? Oranges. Sleeping on the balcony floor in Crete one night, I woke to see the silhouette of the roof slide over and mask the one glass glint star. The stone house shuddered. The balcony twitched under my sleeping bag like a horse gathering to buck its rider. But the roof shimmied back into place and revealed the star. A clay tile fell, then quiet. Unlike the story a prisoner told once about the hole in his poem. It was in a bar one minute. He was standing there, and the next he was on the floor bleeding, which was everything his poem hadn't said. The other man died. That season in Crete, I was looking for the hole in everything I knew. I'd rise at dawn, pack Augustine's confessions and oranges, take the bus out of town to hike the high pastures and goat paths and sleep on the ground to the tolling of goat sheep bells. I thought the stars would tell me a truth. The stones were hard under my back. A sheep tiptoed up and breathed on my face. I had nothing yet to confess. God was a large idea and awfully far. By dawn, the stars had paled, and I woke stiff, hungry, and elated, and hiked eight hours down the gorge into a story I did not yet know. Um, let's see. And I'll read the title poem of this book and then read some new ones. Let me get a little more water. It's true, as Rebecca said, there are a lot of ghosts in this book. They give perspective. <laughs> Um, they can see things that we can't. Ghost in a red hat. These cabbages under full sail, these ancient walls smothered in ivy and wisteria with its purple froth, in my middle age and sensible girth, I remember starving. I didn't know why. I practiced being a ghost. I was a girl. I thought this was how one became a woman. I lived in a village in Italy. It was picturesque. I was not picturesque. That was the project. I gnawed stale bread, roamed vineyards and olive groves, 
drew portraits of artichoke plants under twisted trees, recited Petrarch, and grew so thin I was a dazzling knife blade in my new white pants. The old grandmother quietly cursed in a corner. Her family ignored her. They ignored me. I recited more Petrarch and bought a broad-brimmed crimson straw hat. What to do with this girl? She learned to survive long spells of dryness. She embraced strangers, and they stayed strange. She painted still lifes, and they stayed still. She dreamed she attended a soiree at a Soho loft where the main dish on a platter garnished with parsley was a woman's naked torso, roasted, belly down, crisply hot. She looked for the small flame guttering in a sacred jar. Giving birth was one way. Holding a dying man's hand was another. She buried small animals with appropriate rites in the backyard. And here are the generations. Water and fire begat turpentine, which joined earth and brought forth color from mineral loins and boiled down vegetable soul. So steeped and soaked this land where I live now, so rushing in rain, Roof tiles bristle in moss, close woven or feathery, sprigging with spores. The cemetery teems, lichen, honeysuckle, roses, little mildewed photographs under glass. Enemies make peace. Centuries fall through limestone cracks. And Edith, came up the street this morning to bring me Le Monde and La Revue des Deux Mondes and a packet of fresh goat cheese before setting out in rain on her drive to the Dordogne. I, I had an amusing experience with this poem. I, uh, it was being translated into Italian by uh, an older man, a Italian poet, whose work I greatly respect and whose work I have translated into English. And he just couldn't stand this picture of an unattractive woman. <laughs> so he wanted to beautify it. And um, we really argued about it. I said, this is not about Bella Figura. This is uh, an ugly poem. You have to uglify this poem. <laughs> And he said, no, it's non impossible, non impossible. <laughs> anyway, I finally got my way. But it was revealing, because the whole point was that this was not about the bella figura. <laughs> it's a, really an argument about aesthetics. <clears throat> um, OK, here are a few new ones. This is a poem, a kind of love letter to the uh, Renaissance poet uh, Mary, Sidney, Mary Sidney, who is the Countess of Pembroke and the sister of Sir Philip Sidney. And she's a terrific poet, uh, 16th century poet, better than most people know. I urge you to go out and read Mary Sidney. And mostly you could read her in her translation of the Psalms from the Hebrew. This is the so-called Sidney Psalms. About a third of them were translated by her brother, Philip, but two-thirds by Mary after Philip's death. Uh, and it, ha it, it is in a most astonishing radical, one of the most astonishing radical books in the English language. I, I think the 16th century is a lot more modernist and revolutionary than anything the 20th century modernists did. There are more verse forms in the Sydney Psalms than practically anywhere else in English. And anyway, she, she was an incredible poet. This is called The Triumph of Death to Mary Sidney because she also translated Petrarch's The Triumph of Death. And you'll see, you'll see I, I've woven in quotations from her psalms and little references to, to Petrarch here. The Triumph of Death to Mary Sidney. In your lace ruff, you resemble a giant snowflake or a spider web, pearled with dew. What poets you catch in your symmetries at your long table at Wilton, 
What wit! Spencer, Fulk, Greville, Drayton, pitch into the roasted piglet, stewed apples, carp. If you roused God up, he knocked you back on your heels, lady. Oh, God, why hast thou thus repulsed and scattered us? Through the high windows at Wilton seethe rumors of battle, Philip's pussing thigh, death in the lowlands, mother wrong, daughter strife, stalk the cities. Still, you keep house with grammar. You salt the psalms for long preserving. As smoke in wind, as wax at fire doth waste, the unjust dissolve. Your stanzas stay, still sting the tongue. Dawn finds you kneeling on stone, calling again the bleak God you believe will answer you. You mix medicines, you write in invisible ink, but time trumps fame, which undoes death, which masters chastity and love, which leaves eternity, your master wrote, master of all. And like your lace, your lines shine not pale, but whitely and more whitely pure than snow on windless hill that flaking falls as one whom labor did to rest allure. Translate us to rough line by line into your crystalline, severe design. I spend a lot, I spent a lot of my childhood in France and I spend a lot of my summers there now. Uh, not tourist France, again, not pretty France. France is a tough and suffering country right now, um, not unlike the United States in that regard. Um, and this scene in this poem, July, is it happens to be in France, but it, it could be in any advanced industrial society where there are bored teenagers. July. Under the cliff walls of apartment blocks, on a narrow patch of grass as tough and discolored as old carpet. They have parked their motorbikes and distributed themselves. A tribe, a colony, girls and boys, some lounged on the sward, some on cement paving in a strip of shade, some on two facing wrought iron benches planted in concrete. Out of range of grown-ups, they play cards, they scuffle. A girl places her head on a boy's lap to practice kissing. They smoke, they pass lit cigarettes back and forth. A smaller boy pops a soccer ball against the wall with slow, heat-drugged, sidewise kicks. Hours pass, cigarettes burn down. The ball thuds and shadows lengthen across concrete from four cypresses and six anorexic ginkgos. Day is endless. Summer is endless. Their throats sweetly sear. They drink coke and toss the plastic bottles on the grass. This place, for now, is theirs. They can throw what they want their lungs are their own to burn. Their limbs loll in the loosened harmony of dancers at rest. They can pick themselves up when they want. And here we are in New York. As if. The massive, grimy river shouldered its way toward the harbor. I stood under the ruckus of sky. The wind plucked awnings, plastic bags, newspapers, and sent the news twirling over corduroy waters. I'd meant to see art, but the plan miscarried. A guitarist stationed in a doorway bent his head to rasp his ballad into the wind's sore throat, 
Rainlight glossed the guitar strings and played its own tune. This city, such a storm of wants. You have a right to your actions, but never to your actions fruits, said Krishna in a book I read with all the etc. about desire and emptiness. What did I want? And why did I want it so hard? Not emptiness, but a self like rain driven, a slant the fence, the hacked at sycamore. That morning, laid out on a marble slab at the store, the exposed red knob of a fish's heart kept its pulse in the butchered half creature. No gills, no head, no fins, no guts, no tail, just the flat half body and spine and the heart blurping and shuddering in its own obstinate rhythm, as if, it seemed to say, as if, you idiot, you ever could be free. Um, let's see. Back to France. <laughs> Um, there's a new, well, to, new to me, just in the last few years, kind of group of homeless people in France who are not the gypsies, the, the real gypsies that I've known since early childhood, um, and, and not the old clochards, the old bums, but these are kind of a tribal, more or less youthful set with very distinct costume of dreadlocks and kind of slightly military fatigues and very uh, alarming dogs. And they seem to cluster in a tribal way. And um, they're a, a very distinct presence now. And I think a, a, a way of you know, clearly a population not happy with the mall, you might say. And... You know, seeing them a lot where I, I live in the summers and in Montpellier in, so, in southern France, it makes me realize how, in some sense, in some metaphysical sense, nobody's really at home here. And the, the, the title of the poem is the French sociological jargon for the homeless. It's called Sans Domicile Fixe, Without Fixed Abode. And it's in the, the jargon in the newspapers is SDF. Sans Domicile Fixe. Clouds like boulders boulders like petrified clouds that rolled down and stalled in the meadow. That was yesterday. Now we're in the centripetal apartment with peonies aging in two vases, pink and cream petals frizzling into crepe. Mirrors multiply the years. I see you seeing me in the gilt-framed oval by the desk. I see us both in the window reflected in the closet door glass. My eye corners crease. Flecks of dark chocolate streak the inner spines of all the books. Words are drugs. Love is a drug. While Europe contracts into dark burgundy upholstery and cushions. Deep in the French-English dictionary, three asterisks mark extreme vulgarity. How long can we stay here? Outside, the new homeless twist dreadlocks and pace their mastiffs. Tattoos bulge on their forearms. Paper wrappers and crushed cans clot the gutter. Sun leaps off the roof tiles. A brisk sea wind. In the mountains, those small purple flowers with pods and curling tendrils, now you tell me, were vetch. Let's see, I'm just about to wrap up here. Um, um, I don't know what, I'm not explain very much about this poem. I'm about to read Rats. I'll simply say it's about an old dear old and beloved friend who was became a very uh, masterful painter and one of the most um, uh, really heroic of the early AIDS activists 
who died of AIDS. Rats. As if you rose out of your coffin, as if my heart was your coffin, you rose yesterday in the turquoise faceted light of syringes, hospital sheets, and toxic Niagara mist you painted into a glossy forever. I felt again your weight upon me that Manhattan night in our quasi-childhood. You moved lovelessly upon me, almost angry. Anger, I almost allowed myself to know. As we lay on a borrowed floor, trying to make what might be called love, you broke each spell, the way Proust discovered love, in captured rats squealing as the hat pin probed their vital organs. I was a slow student. I learned dumbly, blindly, and graduated to my own destructions. The white rats scamper through your landscapes of pill bottles and blood, chopped trees, and massacred Adirondack deer. And I dream of knocking all the books off my shelf so that in the light breaking from those pages, I might behold, not hold, your broken face. And I'll end with a poem about seeing. Glaucoma. Garnet flashes in the wild turkey's wattle as late sun singes the far edge of the meadow. Lacework bird calls unravel little by little into a frayed cat's cradle for catching shadow. Ceremonial as bishops in their jerking strut, the turkeys process into the transept of white pines up the slope where the millefeuille shale lies shut in an ancient book all scribbled between the lines. The yellow fungus arrays its party dress over petticoat and flounces. It dreams of rot. The stream, silver-tongued, has more to discuss as day grows tired and changes the subject, but only in highlights now and undertone. The black bear on our walk gave me a hard look, then lolloped up the hill this afternoon, melting into the grove of beeches across the brook. We're all melting. This house is not our own. Daily, my vision fails. What will it be no longer to stare at bronze beech leaves strewn on the loamy floor, at the stream's currency, not to see the pearled shadowless dawn unspool the field? At the edge of the pond, a single heron stood, a hieroglyph. I don't know what he spelled. And Diana's last look, just days before she died, enlarged by disease and sleeplessness, her eyes searched mine as if across a no man's land, and as if, by gazing, she could memorize my face. I gazed back, wordless, stroking her hand. Evening has settled now in the apple boughs, the turkeys have gone. A half moon chalks the sky. The stream keeps lisping the only story it knows. And a loosened cobweb veils the moon's eye. Thank you. I guess you want yeah, please wait for the microphone. Uh, yes. Um, hello. Uh, 
I, I have two questions. Yes. Um, but before uh, I ask them, um, I was bristling with indignation on your behalf when the banker came up to you and said, you know nothing about money. And, well, you said the right thing, but I would, I would have barked at him saying something like, um, well, Wallace Stevens said, money is a kind of poetry. Yes, good. <laughs> so, um, anyway, speaking of what, what I would have done, um, I was thinking if I were reading these poems, um, how inadequate my, my own performance would be as compared to yours. Um, and one of the attractions of poetry readings, of course, is to hear the poet read his or her um, poems out, hear her emphases, cadences, stops for breathing, so on and so forth, tone. Um, but that's also a kind of disincentive to go to poetry readings, isn't it? Because um, I, I once heard Anthony Hecht uh, read the Venetian Vespers, and now I can't bear to hear anyone else uh, mm. read read that poem aloud. And when you hear T.S. Eliot in the room, the women come and go, speaking of Michelangelo rather than Michelangelo, you know, so it, it, um, they become not calcified, but those readings become imprinted. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, when you hear your own poems read by um, a stranger or a friend, um, a loved one, or someone you don't like very much, um, do you, what, what's your reaction? Do you flinch when they get things completely wrong? Or, or when they do get something right, which you hadn't anticipated, um, do you exult? Or what, what, what's your reaction when other people read uh, you know, your I've poems? never, I don't think I've ever had the experience of anyone read my own poems to me. So I'm innocent. I, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I, 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 my instinct, my hunch is that one might find something revealed that one hadn't known before, just as when somebody else uh, points things out in your poem, which certainly has happened to all of us who write poems, especially if we're, we're lucky enough to have good critical friends, um, you, you often find things in your work that you hadn't known were there, and sometimes you're delighted and sometimes appalled. But <laughs> thank you. Um, my second question is one of those vague, annoying questions about influence and influences. Um, I think uh, Christopher Ricks wrote recently about um, Hecht again, uh, that ghosts pervade Hecht's work. And as, well, uh, you and I, we read Merrill together, and ghosts pervade Merrill's work as well, right from the first mature poem, um, uh, which takes place in Switzerland, a yeah. country of a thousand years of peace. And um, they both wrote beautiful elegies, in which literally well, ghosts of um, David Calstone let's say. Um, Men die from time to time, said Rosalind, but not, she said, for love. A lot she knew. Yeah. David Calston died of AIDS. And um, were these two late great poets conscious? Well, um, of course, they're, they're there in your mind on some level. But were they also uh, consciously present yeah, as... N not consciously present. The, my great ghost master is Thomas Hardy, who I think has probably the greatest population of ghosts I know in, in, um, in English poetry. Uh, not, not that I'm disparaging the ghosts in Merrill or Hecht, but it's just that Hardy is more permanently present to me and inspiring to me. Well, and all of Hardy is full of ghosts. He's absolutely... He's more ghosts than living people in Hardy. <laughs> Yes. Um, in reading your work, it seems that uh, other languages besides English kind of pervade and have their space. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to how foreign languages have sort mm. of influenced how you look at English, which you write in, in here, and you know what your experiences with that are. Um, thank you. Uh, I grew up partly in Italy and France, and so though I'm not bilingual, I, I do some of my thinking in French, and I read Italian well, and when I'm living there, I speak it easily, and I've steeped in Italian and French poetry, have been since childhood. I also then later studied Latin and Greek, and though my Greek is rusty now, and my Latin not terrific either, but I absorbed those poems in my youth, so that this, the idea of what a poem could be 
was formed for me not only by English poetry that I memorized as a child, because I was I would walk around the house just intoxicated memor reciting Blake and Tennyson at the age of whatever, 12 or so, but um, then by the French poems I memorized, because I went to a French lycée at 12 and 13, so we memorized hundreds of lines, and I'm memorizing La Fontaine and Baudelaire. And that just gets into your bloodstream uh, as, as a set of rhythmical possibilities. And, and then I was lucky enough to have a terrific, terrific Latin teachers when I was an adolescent. And so I, com I completely fell in love with Horace and Virgil uh, and Catullus, and their verse architectures uh, became my refuge. They became my idea of how a poem should be built. And I had, to, in a sense, to find my way back to English, uh, from from the the, the, Fre the especially from the French and the and the Latin, um, and then the, the Italian and the Greek also contributed to that. I, I I'm grateful for this experience because it made me, I think, hypersensitive to English, as English was not a foreign language to me, but in some way, I let it, fe it began to feel slightly foreign, and so it. It, it had that excitement of a material to be worked, and it wasn't completely familiar, which I think anyone who's a writer should consider their native language. We'll say, if, you're, if, you're, if English is your native language, I think you should consider it a foreign language and work with it with that degree of awareness. Great question, thank you. Hi, Rosanna. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I feel perfectly full, like when you've eaten just enough. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, when Rebecca was giving your introduction, she mentioned that you uh, studied visual art as well, although I'm not necessarily satisfied with visual art being the way we describe it, but, um, yeah. so having practiced both forms of expression, um, do you feel like they've corresponded to different voices inside of you, or you've gone to them, um, at different times, or you felt that one has been limited in a certain way and you've almost shaken free of it, um, mm -hmm. and also... Sub question: Do you still paint? <laughs> oh, what, a question, what moving questions! Uh, I wanted um, that verb "want." I seem to write a lot about wanting. <laughs> uh, I, I drew from the age of three. I, I, I it was the way I interpreted reality around me, and I began reading and writing early too. And but I wanted to be through my whole childhood and 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 adolescence and in through college. I, my idea of myself was that I was going to be Matisse, nothing less. And I worked really hard at becoming Matisse. You know, I drew 12 hours a day. I took painting in college. I was given a studio in the graduate art school. I went to Skowhegan. I went to the New York studio. I mean, I, I had great teachers, and I was on fire with it. I could paint till 3 in the morning. I was writing in my notebooks, writing for me, because I couldn't live without that. I sort of felt I couldn't make sense of life without the writing and the painting. And um, gradually in my early 20s, one, having to earn a living, <laughs> which takes a certain number of hours out of the day, um, and probably because something in me really wasn't a painter, because if I had absolutely had to paint to live, I would have. So I found myself, it was this grievous period of about two years between, say, 23 and 25, where I just realized I wasn't spending all the hours a day painting the paintings, and so the paintings weren't going anywhere. And just very gradually, the writing had taken over, and then the teaching to earn a living. And I sort of well, I eventually had to say, look, you are not a painter, which was a really anguishing acknowledgement to make. Um, but I don't... I don't regret all those years I gave to painting because they trained me how to see. They trained me the same way that growing up with foreign languages made me think that English was a foreign language. Growing up trying to be a painter taught me that what you see is not what you see, if that makes any sense. You have to look into and into and into, and it becomes more and more miraculously strange and, and re revelatory. Um, so a lot of my friends are painters, sculptors, photographers, uh, and I haunt the galleries, and I live vicariously through art because there's something there that writing just can't do. There's a form of incarnation, a kind of presence that writing is always trying to catch up behind, taking notes on what was made present. Um, so, yeah, it's like awakening an old... It's, 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 it's a grief that was a grief that was... is no longer a grief, but is a rich source of nourishment. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, maybe we should go have some cookies. <laughs> thank you so much. Speaking of rich source of nourishment, <laughs> thank you all for coming and thank you, Tufts. <laughs>